first one you'll be singing, and the next one you'll be also singing called O Church Arise. Maybe we'll just do one more. Yeah. <laughs> Truth is not in us. That we we sin our sins. sins. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. From peace from above and to our salvation, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen.
cast out all sins and evil desires from us and pour into our hearts your Holy Spirit to guide us into all blessedness. <clears throat> Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh, and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels. Who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their bosom both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they make offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their bosom payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, beginning in chapter 3, verse 23, and continuing into chapter 4. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world.
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The horrendous picture along the front of your service building is exemplified in this reading. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had lived, he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then Jesus went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
emergency, I just left the prayer of the church in the office. And, uh, <laughs> so there we go. lesson for the day. I'm going to start with uh, this little comment. A small boy asked his parents, why are all the vitamins and minerals in spinach <laughs> rather than in ice cream where they ought to be? <laughs> The gospel lesson for the day asks us to bolt down a great big bunch of spinach, and we wish it were ice cream. Because we might ask, uh, why do some of life's most revealing insights come to us not from life's loveliness and easiness, but from life's difficulties? We are treated in this gospel lesson to Jesus go going across the lake to an area which is mostly Gentile, not Jewish. And as he steps ashore, he is greeted by a mentally ill person who has been tortured by demons for a long time. Socially, he's isolated. The people are terrified of him from in the community, and he lives in an isolated way in a cave or caves used as a cemetery. So he's in there with the dead bodies. And the local citizens to control him had him shackled with chains around the wrists and ankles but with superhuman strength, he had shattered the chains, and guards kind of moved him around a little bit because the people were afraid of him, terrified. And people couldn't even travel along the highway in that area. He was so dangerous. Jesus steps ashore to meet this person who yells at him, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, why are you here to torment me? And Jesus asks his name. Jesus treats him as a person, as a human being. He has a name. But the evil spirits yell out through his voice, Legion. Now, in those days, a legion was a couple of Roman divisions, troops numbering anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000, and that's impressive. Jesus wants to help this man. More than vitamins and minerals in spinach, Jesus helped and salvation is here for this man. Even out on the edge of society, he can be brought back. Oh, what wonderful news that is for any and all of us. That salvation is to be found in Jesus' compassion and love and kindness in his innocent suffering and death in our behalf. That's for us, this story is not about some weirdo that Jesus meets. It's for us. Uh, you look at what Jesus did. He could have avoided that person. He didn't have to bother crossing the lake to meet this person. He could have escaped or ignored him. 
No, he didn't. He chose not to. When he went the way of the cross, he didn't have to do that. He had every right to leave us in our mess. In, he didn't have to suffer so that we wouldn't have to suffer. If Jesus were not committed to saving lost people, then the question of his meeting this man or of his suffering and death would never come up. But Jesus was committed to his heavenly Father's saving plan to reach people wherever they were and to give them another alternative than the terrible place where they were without him. And if Jesus weren't ready to face that, then his meeting this man and his going into his suffering and death, that would not have even been a choice. If he hadn't loved us, Ah, but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's what this text is about. Some of us would like to pursue happiness most of our days. It's a noble and right kind of approach to life. But life also has pain and sorrow. And much of life seems to run between the whole, the poles of happiness over here and sorrow over here. We're somewhere in the middle. Some people who do study that kind of thing say there are two major classes of people. Those who actively seek pleasure and those who enjoy life but avoid pain. Emily Dixon, Dickinson, in a little poem, had an interesting perspective on this. She said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and never a word, said she. But all oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. So we don't go out looking for sorrow, but some days it finds us. And then we tend to look at things and say, now wait a minute, we like to be up here, and the downside of life is where we're heading, it seems, because that's where suffering and difficulties and grief and even death are located downhill. And we want to be up here. So many of us have struggled with uh, tragedy and pain and grief only to have emerged cleansed, stronger, more caring, more compassionate. Because we have learned both to laugh and we also know how to cry. And we're between the two. The great message of this little text is that God stands alongside of us. He is with us every step of the way as we put our hand in his and trust him. Uh, God is alongside of us in our sorrow and suffering and God comforts and consoles us as we struggle along to come to terms with some of the little wreckage and damage that has been happening in our lives. This man, the crazy man demonized in pagan territory, is healed. Jesus heals him. And we find him at the end dressed in his right mind and sitting at Jesus' feet in the posture of a learner and a disciple. That's a beautiful picture. Some of us might wish that we were seven feet tall and wanted to play professional basketball 
or that we could uh, once upon a time run a four minute mile and then we, none of us could do that. Well, wanting that or wishing for it doesn't do much for us. But acknowledging that God is with us at the place where we are today is always very helpful. You trust Jesus, your Savior. You trust him for his forgiveness, for his help, and his strength for the day. And you say, Lord, you're my daily companion in life. I look to you. Help me as I go down life's road. That's taking up the cross of Jesus and carrying it with you. Not that you're bearing uh, the crosses and difficulties. That kind of thing comes to everybody. But Jesus, with the cross on, on you, is with you all the way. Some people would like to find the perfect church. And I want to tell you, if um, this were the perfect church and I were to join it, it would stop being perfect anymore. <laughs> because I would uh, bring my sinful self in here and uh, you'd be stuck with me. Gone would be the perfect church. Well, there's a lot of people who are looking for the perfect church. And the truth is, God places us in a, per in a perfect place, the place where we're at today. Doesn't mean we can't move. When he puts us here, it's called the doctrine of calling. The place where you are and where you live is where you are to serve God. Don't look for some idealized place, some place where then you could begin to start serving right where you're at. This man said, these people will never care for me. They shackled me. They chained me. They put me under God. It was a tough place to be. Well, I want to go with you, Jesus. That's the ideal place for me. And Jesus said, no. Go back home. Go talk to your family. Go talk to people in your community. Tell everyone what God has done to help you and to heal you. And he did it. He had a calling. So life has a bigger goal for every one of us than to get a job and get a paycheck or to uh, get on Social Security and uh, cash your pension checks. Because we are sinners dead in sins that God has made us alive in Christ. And there we are to rejoice in the fact that we can live day by day with him. If we're just cashing checks, that's oblivion, ob oblivion. That's pointless, really. But with Jesus, you can rejoice. With Jesus, you can say, Lord, be with me today and be with me more and more. Let your love be rich and full for me. Because that's the way God has called you to live every day by his spirit, trusting the Lord and learning to live with Jesus. That's your calling. Not just choosing a field to earn a living or having chosen one to earn a living, but living with Jesus and serving in his name every day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now we turn to the Catechism and Luther's explanation of the introduction, Our Father, who art in heaven. What does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father, and that we are his true children, so that of all woes and confidence we may ask him as dear children and ask their dear Father. Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? 
Almighty God, we thank you for peace of mind and heart earned for us at the cross. And we ask that you would work for peace, help us work for peace in the world, peace in your church, peace in home, and peace in our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us the gift of pardon and renewal of hearts. Help us that we may love the Lord with all that we are and all that we have. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Lord, we thank you for the Lutheran churches of the Augsburg Confession throughout the world, and we ask for the faithfulness of all churches to the truth of your word and for the proclamation of the good news to all peoples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord God, uh, grant your blessing to the nations and those who govern them for our own country, state, and community, and for its leaders, for our cities, towns, and communities, for good lords, laws, and faithful citizens, for seasonable weather, for the fruitfulness of the earth, and for the wisdom to use resources well. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we lift up to you the needs of the poor and those who are unemployed and underemployed, for the hungry and homeless, the widowed and orphans, and for those languishing in prison. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the sick and those who suffer, for the grieving in their loss, for their dying in their last days on earth. And while we do that, we thank you for the, those who care for the sick and attend to the dying, for those who provide child care, and for all of those who, like the police, firefighters, and the disaster relief workers, uh, help people in their needs. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For women with child, for safety in childbirth, for the children in foster care, and for the preservation of all life from conception to life's natural end, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We come to you with thankful hearts. Uh, impress upon us on the need that we return to you the tithes and offerings that are due you, and we thank you for the witness of those who have gone before us. We give thanks and pray to the Lord to grant us at last a good death and our part and fellowship with those who have gone before. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For these and all other things of body and soul, 
we ask in the name of our <coughs> Savior, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. We give you our thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 